We're in a series called The Gospel. Does anybody love the gospel? Does anybody love Jesus? And last week, I I preached a message. If you were not here, I'd encourage you to go back and listen to it on This Is The Way. And in case you don't know or in case you need to be reminded, the way to eternal life is in Jesus. It's in Jesus and him alone. And so we are continuing this series uh, today, and I want you to turn your Bibles to John chapter 14. John 14. As you're turning there, uh, I'll give a little disclaimer on the message today. Anytime the gospel is preached, particularly the cross is preached, every person that hears it has to make a decision whether they're going to move away from it or move towards it. When the gospel of Jesus Christ is preached, there has to be a response. And anytime you hear it, you either move forward or you move back. And I just want to encourage you to lean in because we, we want to move forward towards Jesus. And this message might not be the most popular message. In fact, I'm going to really challenge you today because picking up your cross for Jesus is not comfortable. It's not easy. We're going to look at what Jesus did on the cross. John chapter 14, verse 1. Then Pilate took Jesus and had him flogged. The soldiers twisted together a crown of thorns and put it on his head. They clothed him in a purple robe and went up to him again saying, Hail, King of the Jews. And they slapped him in the face. So the soldiers took charge of Jesus, carrying his own cross. He went out to the place of the skull, which is Aramaic, which in Aramaic is called Golgotha. There, They crucified him and with him two others, one on each side and Jesus in the middle. The title of the message today is The Cross, His Sacrifice, Our Response. Let's pray. Father, we just thank you for today. We thank you for your presence in this house. We thank you that you're with us. And Lord, I just pray right now as the word goes forth, Lord, I pray that you would anoint my words to preach the cross and to preach the gospel and that everyone hearing it, Lord, it would fall on fertile soil, soil that will reap a harvest of 30, 60, and 100 in Jesus' name. And Lord, I pray that no one here today would leave the way they came in because of your transformation power. In Jesus' name, amen. We know that the cross of Jesus is the symbol of Christianity, as it should be. But one thing we can lose sight of is just how gruesome and brutal Jesus' death is. You know, if you've ever seen a picture where it's just, Jesus hanging on a cross with no blood on it. He's just there. That, that, that is uh, so far from the truth. Now, I'm not going to say these details of the cross to be provocative in any way. I'm saying them because we need to realize just what Jesus did and what he suffered to pay the ultimate price for us. Jesus, the night he was betrayed, he knew what was coming. And he was in such distress because he knew the pain and the torment and the consequence that he was about to bore, that the Bible actually says that he sweat blood. His body, just knowing what he was going to endure, he sweat blood. He was betrayed in a way the the people that were closest to him turned their backs on him. Peter denied him. Judas betrayed him. His disciples left him. And he was all 
alone. And they turned Jesus in. And they began taunting him. Before he even made it to the cross was called the scourging. Now, what they did was they put Jesus and tied him to a large wood post so the skin was stretched on his back extra tight. Then there was the labrum. That was a whip with nine pieces of bone or glass that when the officers struck him, it would at first wrap around his back or be on his back and pull away the skin. Now, Jewish law at the time was you can't go more than 39 lashes. It was believed that actually if you did 40, that would actually, well, that was enough enough to kill a man. But they went way above 39 lashes. Isaiah 52 says this, that Jesus was barely recognizable. He was so beaten and so brutally tormented that his body and his face was just open flesh. Then, after the torment, the Bible says that they hurled terrible insults at Jesus. What's tragic about this is Jesus deserved none of it. In fact, there was a murder, murderer and a criminal that the crowds were riding saying, no, 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 let him go. We want you to kill Jesus. He carried his own cross and couldn't. And then someone had to help him go up to the place of skull where he was pinned down to a cross through his, there was about nine inch nails through each wrist, not through the hand. It was through the wrist actually. And the nerves, incredibly painful. And then they pinned him to that cross and it was not oh, it's 15 minutes or 20 minutes and it's over. He hung there on the cross and bore the sin of the world for hours. Scientists believe that actually Jesus had uh, no, by the time he was uh, getting ready to die and gave up his spirit, they, they, they believe that he had no blood left to die. No more blood left to shed, I'm sorry. He was literally emptied out. Now, again, I don't say these things to bring shock or to bring horror. But we need to be reminded, number one, when we look at the cross of Jesus Christ, we need to realize how serious our sin is. This is serious. Sin is serious. Jesus had to die a terrible, horrible death to pay for you and my sin so we can spend eternity with the Father. Number two, it is a description of just how much God loves you. If you ever wonder just how much Jesus loves you, look at the cross. If you ever feel insignificant, if you ever feel like you don't have enough value, if you feel like, oh man, how how could this ever be paid for? Look at the cross and that speaks the value to you that you are valuable and you are worth the sacrifice of Jesus. Number three, when we look at the cross, we realize that no matter how dark and terrible a situation is, resurrection's coming. Because Jesus did not stay dead. He took up that cross and he died a terrible death and they buried him and he got filled with resurrection power and rose again. Your king did not just die for you. He rose again for you. The cross is the most radical 
picture in all of history. It's radical. Now, I'm going to read a verse to you because this is where things start to get a little uncomfortable for us. Jesus said, okay, you need to take up your cross too. Uh-oh. That, that doesn't sound very fun, does it? Anybody ever wake up and just say, you know what? It just feels like a good, good day for a crucifixion. You know, I, I, just, let's just, you know, persecution and torment and pain and agony. That just sounds just incredible. Run, let me read this verse to you. This is Jesus to the disciples. It says, then Jesus said to his disciples, if any of you wants to be my follower, you must, is that what your Bible says, must? Give up your own way, take up your cross, and follow me. See, when we look at the cross and what Jesus paid for us, that's, that's our ticket to heaven. Us taking up our own, and that, that feels good, doesn't it? That, doesn't it feel good? That, that's why we praise and worship today, because we're not going to spend eternity in hell. We're going to spend eternity in heaven. But when you look at the cross and you see just how terrible it is and how gruesome it is, we think, well, that just puts a little bit of a wrench in God just being uh, our little sidekick. Or when, you know, it's like a lot of people, we never say this, but it's like, you know, people live this way. It's like, you know, God, I'm Batman and you're Robin. It's like, okay, I'm going to let you know, God, if I'm in trouble or if I need your help and I'm just going to live my own way in my own life. And if I need anything from you, I'll just let you know. So what does it mean to take up our cross? Number one, we follow. We follow. Matthew chapter four, as Jesus was walking beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers. Simon called Peter and his brother Andrew. They were casting a net into the lake for they were fishermen. Come, follow me, Jesus said, and I will send you out to fish for people. At once they left their nets and followed him. So Jesus approaches Simon Peter and Andrew, and they are fishermen. And Jesus, I just imagine he's like on the shore and says, hey, follow me. Now, if they don't follow Jesus and they don't drop what they're doing right now in order to follow Jesus, they are not following Jesus. Wouldn't you agree? Right at that moment, he makes the call and they have a decision to make. Are you going to follow? Are we going to follow Jesus or are we going to stay where we are? Are we willing to move for Jesus? Are we move, willing to step out of what we were doing before in order to take up our cross and follow Jesus. Now it says they drop their nets. They drop their nets. In dropping their nets, they drop their provision. They drop their way of life. They dropped everything they knew. They grew up fishermen. And Jesus had no promises for them. He said, hey guys, drop your nets and everything's going to be easy. He's like, hey guys, drop your nets and you're going to be rich and powerful and influential. No, no, no. It's just follow me. They had to choose to drop the person and the things they were doing for Jesus. Now, Following Jesus is not just about what you do follow Jesus in. 
It's actually what you don't do. The nets are what you're willing to drop. You know, Haley and I were just talking about this last night. And, you know, you never know. You never know by meeting Haley, uh, my wife. But, man, she used to cuss up a storm, y'all. Man. Hey, we were both crazy. If you were here last week, you heard some of my testimony. But, you know, so I, I came from a Christian household, and I was a prodigal. So I, I knew the right things to do, but I was just like, no, 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 I'm not doing that. I'm, I'm, I'm living my own life. Haley did not have much of a background. And so we actually both got saved. We both gave our lives to Jesus within like a few weeks of each other. Radical. I was in my apartment. She was in her apartment. It happened all around. And so we start, you know, trying to figure things out and live life. And that woman, it bleep, 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 bleep. And I let it go for a while. And we had to sit down. We were just sat down. I just said, Haley, we need to talk about your cussing. You, you need to stop talking like that. <laughs> And she has no idea. She hadn't even read her Bible yet, really. She's like, why? Well, I explained to Haley, like, um, well, see, before you represented Haley, now you represent Christ. See, when you follow him, you just don't start going to church and serving in church and being a nicer person. There's going to be some things that you need to drop. There's going to be some sanctification and some sin that God needs to get out of your life. You know, this is going to age me a little bit. I'm looking at some of the younger people in the room. But I used to have a sick Blu-ray collection. I mean, I feel that's one of those things that about stand about six feet tall and you walk right up to it. And you, it's, just, it's just lined with movies. DVD, I had a plasma screen TV, 65 inches in an apartment. That thing got so hot, if it was cold outside, you just sit right next to it. Don't even turn the furnace on, just sit next to that thing. That thing got warm. I love my DVD collection. And I didn't just have one stacked up. I had two stacked up. I had all my DVDs, and I was listening to a message, and it was a message about uh, perversion and lust and just, just, just cleansing out that area of your life. And as I'm listening to this message, Jesus spoke, spoke to me and said, all those DVDs with nudity or gore or violence or something that is not adding to your spirit, throw them away. And I knew God wasn't in the mood to negotiate with me. And I wasn't going to look Jesus in the eye and say, but Lord, you know I love 300. Come on, Lord, it, 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 it brings out the warrior in me. Yeah. There's so many times that God will call us to lay something down. Now, we are under grace. We're under mercy. In a lot of ways, we can't mess this up. But in many ways we can stay very unfruitful and very carnal. Jesus starts moving in your life and, and he starts speaking something to you and he starts moving and it's like, okay, I either have to move into this, I need to start doing this or I need to stop doing this or I'm not following Jesus. And sometimes it's that black and white. You know, I just feel this by the Spirit. Some of you, God's been telling you to quit your job for like a year, and you just won't quit it. Because you are married to the comfort and convenience and security of that job, and you are not married to Christ and following him. Now, that's strong, but I'm, I'm here trying to help you to get into your purpose. I'm here in you trying to get you to follow Jesus here. We don't get a vote and we don't get to choose what we follow Jesus in and what we is. The, the same rules that apply for me as a pastor apply to you. It's like, well, he's a pastor. You should pray every day and read his Bible. Yeah, yeah. No, the same rules apply for you. That's the cross. 
Everyone should read their Bible. Everyone should worship. Everyone should praise. Everyone should live holy. Everyone should pick up their cross and follow Jesus. We need to follow. I'll say this too. In my preparation, I felt this so strongly that there are people in this room that are bored and miserable and depressed because you haven't stepped into the adventure of following Jesus. When Jesus says go, and when Jesus says follow, and you start taking steps toward him, I'm telling you, something inside of you will be unlocked. It may be scary. It may be concerning. You may not have all the answers because God doesn't always give you all the answers. But I'm telling you, there is nothing that compares to the fulfillment of following Jesus. And you're right now, if you're stuck and you're depressed and you're lonely and you're like, I feel like I have no purpose, there is no way you feel that way and be totally radically following Jesus. It does not work that way. Because when you start following Jesus, some, something comes alive in you. Something feels, oh, this is kind of risky. Oh, I'm living by faith now. I'm not living by this mind. I'm living by his mind, and I've lost my life, and I'm following him. There is fulfillment in that. People move to Colorado all the time because they are searching for adventure. And you got people trying to find something up there in the mountains on a snowboard that they will never find up there. They can only find in Christ. The church has the answers. It's following Jesus. That is the best adventure you can ever step into. Number two, we die. I told you it's going to be uncomfortable. Galatians 2.20 I have been crucified with Christ and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. When you crucify, when you are crucified with Christ, The Bible says the old you is no longer alive. The old Neil that was dancing on tables in Vegas, (laughs) doing all kinds of crazy stuff, that, that Neil's dead. I've been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ living in me. And what that looks like is we must crucify the flesh. Check this out. Romans chapter 8. This is self-denial. Those who live according to the flesh have their minds set on what the flesh desires. But those who live in according with the Spirit have their minds set on what the Spirit desires. The mind governed by flesh is death. But the mind governed by the Spirit is life and peace. The mind governed by the flesh is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law, nor can it do so. Those who are in the realm of the flesh cannot please God. When you are in the flesh, you can't serve God because you're serving yourself. The flesh is that raging desire that is ungodly. The flesh is is unable to produce any amount of fruit. And here's what a carnal Christian lives like. They are the ones that believe in Jesus, but don't take up their cross. They let Their desires run wild. I felt led to say this in my preparation, that marriage reveals your carnality. See, what happens in marriage is the things that you can't fake in dating, you bring into marriage. When you get married, you're living in the same house, and all of a sudden, 
the issues of life begin to come to the surface. In marriage, what happens is these are two fleshly, carnal people that have their both will and both their way. And if they don't both die to that flesh, it's going to cause some major issues. Can I get an amen? Does anybody, does anybody resonate with this? Because Neil got his butt kicked the first year of marriage. You know, if I had a dollar for every time Haley had to confront me on leaving my wet towel on the ground and had to tell me that she's not my mommy, you know, I'd be retired by now. <laughs> issues in our marriage, issues in our life, guys, God made it this way. The things that God wants to redeem come up to the surface. And guess who sees it? Your spouse. And people, they either deal with those issues or those issues begin to multiply. And if you go too long without those issues being dealt with in a way and those fleshly things being crucified, after a while, it ultimately lends to divorce. See, The worst marriages are carnal marriages. The best marriages, those two people, they've crucified their flesh. They're serving each other. They're serving Jesus. Anytime they they feel like, you know, they want to have an attitude or press their own way or make their own way in their marriage, they say, you know what? No, no. Neil, this, this is dead right now. I've committed to my wife that I am going to serve God and serve her. And here's the thing with husbands. Jesus said, he said in in the scriptures, it says that husbands love your wives as Christ loved the church. Now, let me ask you this, since we're talking about the cross, what did Jesus do for the church? He died. See, We need to die to all those attitudes, all those habits, and all those different things. We had a couple over uh, at at our house, and this was years ago. And uh, Haley and I were married for for five or six years. And uh, this couple was just engaged. And this couple just riding high on just momentum and excitement and you know, she, Haley and her, they're showing Pinterest boards of all the things in the wedding and, you know, talking about this and dreams and just, just amazing, an incredible time. And so they sit down and I'm the kind of guy that kind of likes to just get to the point. And, and so we're sitting down and talking and enjoying ourselves. And uh, the, the husband, uh, the, the future husband, just turns, turns to us and it just said, hey, do you guys got any advice? <laughs> I just felt the Spirit of God say, give it to him. <laughs> and I say, we still laugh about it this day. I say, that wedding day that you're so excited for, I want you guys to think that more as a funeral than a wedding. <laughs> Haley goes, oh my goodness. And you should see all that, all that excitement and that joy. Oh, yeah, give me, give me some good advice. Give me that to me. It was like the eyes got glazed over, and they were just in shock. They're like, what? And I'm like, no, no. This is literally the best advice I can give you. Die to yourself. Die to yourself and die to your flesh. We serve. Number three, we serve. When we take up our cross, we stop serving ourselves and we start serving God. Now, I'm going to make a statement, and don't don't think I'm trying to be manipulative here in saying this, because I'm the pastor and I oversee the serve team. (laughs) I believe that most everyone in every season should serve in church. I really do. I really do. Now, there's a lot of ways to, to serve Jesus, 
what the best way to do it is in the local church. Now, at the same time, I'll say this, that, that I've told many people that they need a break because they're burnt out, they're tired, or their life is not quite in order And what they don't need is another thing to exert energy in. They need to get their life in order, not not to serve. They need to get it in order so they can serve. I'll tell you guys this. If everyone in this room served, there'd be mountains and hills that we're climbing as a church that we're not right now. It's true. There are things and people that we could be reaching if everyone was serving. It's so important. Now, I've also at the same time heard like every excuse in the book why people can't serve. (laughs) I've heard, you know, just all, all kinds of things and all kinds of excuses. And I get it. Life happens. Things happen. But I will say this, that as a person, what you value least falls off first. See, at the top of your values, that's going to be the last thing to go when you get busy, when you get pressed, when it's a tough season. If the first thing that goes in your walk with Christ or in your life, if the first thing that goes when you get busy is church, is reading your Bible, is prayer, is serving in church, then you actually just revealed, I'm just saying this because I want you to catch this. You're actually saying you value that the least. Jesus was crucified for us. And when we take up our cross and follow him, we serve the king. See, a lot of times we don't understand kingdoms because we live in a democracy. And we we live in a democracy, and so uh, we've never been a part of a kingdom. But in a kingdom, there's a king. And in the kingdom, the king is in charge. And in that kingdom, when the king says, we've got to take this hill, we got to take that hill. When the king says, we go, we go. And the hard part about that is, is we, we don't get a vote. <laughs> we, we, don't, we don't get to vote on these kingdom things. And serving God is just not about church. This is serving God in every area of our life. Colossians 3.23 says, Whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord, not for human masters. Since you know that you will receive an inheritance from the Lord as a reward, it is the Lord Christ you are serving. So what happens is, is when we really pick up our cross and follow Jesus. It encapsulates everything of our lives. Instead of saying, okay, I'm going to be a better person or I'm going to try harder in this. It's like, God, you've called me to this job. And I'm no longer doing it for myself and doing it for the money, and doing it for this, or whatever motives you have, God, this is unto you. I am serving you by bringing my best to this job. Everything we do, it encapsulates it all. We serve. We serve. You know, I was reminded of Peter, and worship team, you can go ahead and come up. But Peter, we know Peter denied Jesus. We know that he was one of the disciples 
And he was, he was all in with Jesus. But on that day, when Peter came to the point of standing up for Jesus or not standing up for Jesus, he denied even knowing Jesus. I can't imagine what that would feel like to know the Lord face to face and deny Jesus. But Peter is an example for all of us about actually how to fail properly. See, Peter failed properly because he allowed the Lord to restore him. Judas failed improperly because he betrayed Jesus and took upon the punishment for himself. Judas killed himself. And Jesus spoke some words over Peter. One of the biggest statements in all of scripture, he said, Peter, your your name means rock. And on this rock, you, Peter, I will build my church. And the gates of hell will not prevail against us. See, Peter allowed Jesus to restore him in picking back up his cross. And the same Peter that denied Jesus and was restored by Jesus stood in front of crowds that hated him and wanted to kill him and boldly preached the gospel. If there's any picture of picking up your cross and following Jesus, it's Peter. Because sometimes we have so many of these disqualifying thoughts or I can't serve Jesus because of this or I can't pick up my cross because of this or I can't die to myself because of this. When you look into the eyes of Jesus, all the excuses begin to melt away. Because Peter literally denied the Lord and God restored him, but he boldly preached it unto persecution and I don't know if you know this but Peter was charged to be put to death and they were going to crucify him and Peter actually requested and said I'm not worthy to die like Jesus I'm willing to die for Jesus, but I'm not worthy to die like Jesus. And Peter, on that day, he was crucified upside down. Peter laid it all on the line for Jesus, but he said, in serving God this way until my final breath, not only will I die for this, I will not die like Jesus. I will die in another way because I'm not even worried, uh, I'm not even worthy to be crucified like Jesus. See, when we hear these things, it challenges us because all of a sudden we look at all the excuses and all the reasons why we can't follow Jesus or the inconveniences or the lack of comfort or whatever that excuse is on why you haven't picked back up your cross or why you won't pick up your cross. All that goes away when you realize, Jesus, you did this all for me. And I, I, it's my honor to even die for you. And so the answer is, yes, I will follow you. Yes, I will crucify my flesh. I will step into the gap and I will lay my life down for my wife and my family. I will bury that bad attitude. I will bury that depression. I'll bury that negative thinking. I'll bury that stubborn pride. I will destroy that in my life only with your help because God, you are worthy of all of this. It is our joy and it is our honor. And this looks like a lot of sacrifice, but here's the thing. When you follow Jesus, not only do you get to heaven for eternity, but you get to live a life 
of fulfillment and purpose and a life with Jesus. See, you, you, you lay down everything, but you get him. You get Jesus himself. You don't get a lifestyle. You don't get some good vibes to take to work with you. You get the Lord himself. You get Jesus, and he is the most wonderful, loving, kind, provisional God you can ever imagine. Paul said this, to live is Christ and to die is gain. I count it all garbage and rags my old life that I did compared to the precious value of loving Jesus and knowing him. See, he's not gonna promise you necessarily wealth or power or influence, but he will promise you himself. And there is nothing greater than Jesus. And by the way, when you start taking into the principles and you start destroying your flesh, your pride starts going away and you start performing better at work because you have some humility and you're not, you're not running your mouth as much and then you actually get promoted and then you get more blessed because you're not acting like an idiot anymore. You're acting like Jesus. That's a good thing. See, when you decide to do all these things, he doesn't dangle a carrot with blessings for you. He says, you've crucified yourself, you're following me, and I'm not just here to say, oh, hey, here's some good things for you to follow me. It's like, no, you get me, and oh, by the way, here's some blessings. I felt led to to do something a little bit different today because I believe that Jesus is here and Jesus wants to move, and I just believe so desperately that God wants every single person for this message to be renewed in them. I hope I articulated it well. I hope I explained it well. I hope I made it simple, but Jesus is the real messenger today. And I believe he wants to speak some things and do some things in your heart and in your life. When you do this, when you say yes to God, It's amazing what happens. And I believe that God wants to renew us taking up our cross and following him. I believe he wants to renew that passion and that zeal. And maybe you've been out of the game for a while, but today, right here on Sunday, March 10th, you can say, you know what? I'm picking back up my cross. I'm doing that. And I don't mean to make anyone uncomfortable, but I actually want to invite us here in a moment for us all to stand up out of our seats and come down to this altar. I believe it is a prophetic act of what happens when we actually stop sitting in the places that we're in, stuck, concerned, worried, and fearful, and when we stand up and go to Jesus. And so right now, Wherever you are, if you're a a member of this church, if you're not a member of this church, I'm gonna open this up right now and I'd like every single person, if you don't mean it, don't do it. But if you do mean it, please come down. I want to encourage you, stand up right now and come forward.